Hey everybody, welcome B-Side San Antonio. And this is the Lessons Learned Crash and in Information Security Management System Implementation. It's my honor to introduce Rose Songer. She's a GRC consultant with CISO LLC. And prior to joining the CISO team, she worked as a third party management lead at a major retailer. And within that program, she developed a comprehensive framework and evaluation process to assess vendors, as well as integrated in automation with the cloud platform. And Rose has a diverse IT and security background, spanning over 13 years in network security and administration, enterprise vendor risk management, and security awareness program development and implementation. She brings over eight years of experience from her time spent in the Navy as an information system technician. She also has an MS in cybersecurity and information insurance and a BS in advanced networking. Her industry experience spans healthcare, federal government, and retail. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump into the talk. Here's Rose. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk on lessons learned, crash course, and ISMS. Um, I decided to submit this talk for a presentation because over the past couple years, I have gotten um, in super crash course in all things ISMS, um, and in particular ISO 27001, which we'll dig into as part of this presentation. Um, so I decided to take all of those things that I learned, the good, the bad, the ugly, and figure out how I could better enable others to not be in a position that they're learning all of these things while they're doing an implementation. Um, so we're gonna dig into what are these lessons learned and how you can learn from them and what you should consider as part of your own um, implementation. So uh, first things first, a little bit about me. My name is Rose. Um, I am a governance risk and compliance manager for CISO. Um, and we're based in Pittsburgh. So as part um, of what I do at my company, actually what my company does as a whole is we work with companies that are looking to improve their security posture through various mechanisms. Um, they could be looking to improve cloud security, enterprise security, um, their governance risk and compliance programs and all sorts of things like that. And so our company works with small to mid-sized um, companies that are looking to improve those security postures, and they may be looking to do it for a variety of reasons. It may be, you know, compliance or regulatory driven, or they've had incidents in which they decided that they're going to try to put better security measures in. Um, so what I do at CISO is I am a governance risk and compliance manager, and um, I oversee all of our GRC services, including um, development of those services and innovating in those services, uh, as well as the execution teams. So I provide all oversight to the, the GRC functionality at CISO. Um, I have a master's in cybersecurity and a bachelor's in advanced networking. Uh, I've been in IT for 15 years. I joined um, the Navy right out of high school at 18 and um, ended up spending a lot of time in IT, uh, resulted in spending about a year as a network engineer implementing statistics on routers and switches. And um, I started really getting a taste of security when I did that role in the Navy. And so when I trans transitioned out of being in the Navy, um, I decided to pursue security. And so the last nine years has been just security focused uh, and primarily governance, risk, and compliance. I have tons of industry experience um, just based on the different jobs that I've had, being in the military, and now being a consultant. Um, and then also, I always like to call him out because he likes to make himself known for all of my presentations that I do or any virtual meetings. I do have a co-presenter with me today. His name is Dexter. He uh, may clean himself during this presentation. I promise you guys I will make sure that he keeps it to a minimum. Uh, so what I also like to do as part of my presentations is I like to do what I call show and tell. Um, just so you guys get to know a little bit about me. I'm not talking at you. You're getting to put some of the qualities of me towards what I'm actually talking about. Um, so like I said, I'm in Pittsburgh. I've been in Pittsburgh for a couple of years now since around 2017. Um, I have two kids, one's 11 and one's nine. 
um, my 11 year olds going into middle school and uh, just makes me feel much, much, much older than I actually am. And I'm married. So um, that's a little bit about me and my little, uh, little life out here in Pittsburgh. So let's jump into this presentation. I'm sure you guys love learning all about me, but that's not why you're here today. You're here to about, learn about my lessons learned, right? So um, before we can jump into the lessons learned, we are going to do what I call ultra crash course in ISMS. Um, I want you guys to understand all the different things that I'm about to talk about. Um, so we're going to do an ultra crash course, which is super teeny tiny version of all the things I've been experiencing recently. Um, as one thing, item of note, uh, I used recently used these same materials as part of a capstone that I was teaching at Duquesne University here in Pittsburgh. Um, I taught some students on how they would go about implementing an ISMS. So some of these materials were pulled directly from that class that I taught. Um, so we're going to talk about what exactly is an ISMS. Is it even worth implementing? Um, ongoing program maintenance and ISO 27001 breakdown. So the ISO is a big component of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and so when I say ISMS, keep ISO 27001 in mind. Now, what exactly is the ISMS? I've referred to it multiple times now, um, but what does that mean? So it stands for Information Security Management System. Um, and it's, essentially, it is a cycle of continuous improvement leveraging the Plan, Do, Check, Act. Um, so the graph there on the right, you can leverage that to develop your ISMS. And what it's going to do is take all of these processes and this governance and um, policies and things like that, and they're going to put it into place with the security controls. And the whole idea behind this is not only are you improving um, via the continuous improvement cycle, but you're hitting that really important aspect of security that we always hit on in security, and it's confidentiality, integrity, and availability um, any of that data or any of that data or the information in your um, so the ISMS is going to take those fundamentals and they're going to put it into a standardized way that you can have that ongoing management of your program. So return on investment, is it even worth doing? Absolutely. I think it is 150% worth doing um, if you do it right. If you don't do it right and you miss the things that you need to do, it may result in rework. Um, extra budget and things like that. So it's really important to do your due diligence before you even implement to make sure that you know what you're getting into. But I promise you, well worth the investment as long as you make sure you do your due diligence ahead of time to understand what you're doing. Um, so return on investment, you're gonna have better communication, you're gonna have better transparency. So your ISMS, it really is all about the communication, all about making sure the workforce understands all about making sure management understands. And so naturally you're gonna build communication and transparency. Look at him, told you, he always cleans himself. Um, let's see, competitive advantage. Whenever you are uh, providing services to another party, um, obviously you wanna have a competitive advantage over um, other people that maybe are delivering on those same services. So um, this will give you a leg up on your competition. Uh, additionally, clients are going to start requesting proof that you have security controls in place. So um, your ISO certification is going to be able to allow you to say, here, here, third party, we have all the controls in place. You can look at our certification, you can look at our statement of applicability, and you can see all these things. Um, improves your resilience to cyber attack. So um, we've seen it over and over again recently. Cyber attacks are becoming more known throughout the world, and the media is definitely playing a big part on highlighting these things happening. Um, so this will allow your organization to be better prepared when those things happen. So when, not if, because likely a lot of organizations are going to have a breach, um, going to experience a cyber attack in some way. And so this allows you just to be better prepared. Uh, you're going to improve your change management, so no pushes to fraud, no changes in the infrastructure, anything like that without making sure that security was involved in the discussion and making sure that security is good with this change. Um, this is probably my favorite aspect of return on investment for ISMS. It's building blocks to other frameworks. Um, short story time, I have 
two different clients that recently did in, um, an ISO implementation. Um, one client decided that they, um, they actually implemented ISO a couple years ago and we've been doing their surveillance audit. They decided to build high trust on top of their framework. And so they built all the high trust controls. There was about 293 into their framework and they were able to leverage their ISMS to ensure they have compliance and get those controls. And then I had another client they had an aggressive timeline that was being forced by a client. Client said, hey, you have to get this certification within the timeline that we're saying. And so they did an ISO implementation with SOC 2. And so it truly is a building block to other frameworks, to other things that you're trying to achieve. So just keep that in mind as a good return on investment. If your organization has pipe dreams of wanting to get you know, tons of um, different frameworks implemented, this is definitely your starting point and will set you up for future success. And then enforces that continuous improvement life cycle. So we talked about that on the previous slide. Uh, program management. So your ISMS is wonderful at um, building that organizational culture. Uh, my one client that they have ISMS and high trust or ISO and high trust their organization is very security focused. Um, and that is because of all the curating of understanding non-performities and understanding opportunities for improvement and enabling the workforce to know when to come to security and when to report and having risk management meetings and doing all these things. Not only that, up the chain, the senior leadership understand this as well. So you'll have really good program management. Um, you'll have auditable artifacts. So we'll get into prepping for an audit um, at the tail end of this presentation. And then it requires top management support. So you absolutely cannot do this without leadership buy-in. And we're gonna touch on that in a little bit. So um, make sure you have that buy-in and have it continuous buy-in. You can't just have it once at implementation. It needs to be during the ongoing maintenance of this program. And then you're gonna need to have an internal audit. So you have to have internal audit um, just to ensure that your program is operating right. So let's talk about ISO a little bit. Now, we we'll talked about what exactly is the ISMS and things like that. ISO 27001, um, this is built off of uh, Information Security Management System, an ISMS. And the ISO 27001 is broken into two different areas. You have clauses 4 through 10, and you have Annex A. Clauses four through 10 are mandatory. You must do every single thing listed in that clause. And keep in mind that each of the clause has sub bullets and you have to make sure that you're hitting all of them. Now, Annex A is a little bit different. Annex A is a, a catalog of information security controls that are only mandatory as a result of a risk assessment. So what I mean is you did a risk assessment, you have unacceptable risk, you create a risk treatment plan, and that risk treatment plan results in remediation of the unacceptable risk through Annex A. So when you look at Annex A, there's roughly 114 controls, and you can see um, on the graph, on the right, the bottom graph, it breaks it down into the different areas that encompass those 114 controls. So when you select the controls to remediate your unacceptable risk, those are going to be the mandatory controls that you have to implement. Now, most organizations end up implementing all of the Annex A, um, so that way, whenever they do get audited and you have your statement of applicability, you're not going to have any exclusions to your program. Um, but just keep in mind that the only things that are mandatory are the only things that result from the risk assessment and the clauses work through 10. So, that's that's your high level overview. Like I said, that was going to be a super crash course in ISMS and ISO. It's not meant to, um, you know, give you the full breakdown. It's just meant to level set you guys um, and kind of take you along with these other lessons learned that I have here. So what are the must do items? Um, what are the things that are expected of you as you go through an ISO certification, as you implement the ISMS? Um, the first thing that I want to call out, mandatory documents. So um, 
while we talk about the ISMS, a large component of it is going to be governance, risk, and compliance um, in some capacity. And the very first item here is definitely hitting on that. Um, but in addition to governance, risk, and compliance, keep in mind there's a very high technical part of this. Um, if you recall the, the one graph that I pointed out about Annex A, over half of those controls are IT related, and IT is vague in this sense. Um, so just keep that in mind that while GRC will largely govern the program, there's going to be a technical component that will need to contribute to things like the mandatory documents and other things going on. So we'll jump into the mandatory documents more um, in more depth here in a second. We'll also talk about the anatomy of the scope statement and what that means. We'll talk about the statement of applicability. Um, we're not going to deal with the clauses four through 10, because quite frankly, they're quite extensive. If you are going to go down the path of pursuing ISO 27001, um, highly recommend that you become very familiar with expectations of clauses four through 10. They are must do items. Uh, implementation of Annex A controls based on unacceptable risk. We talked about that on the last slide. And then internal audit. So you have to have internal audit and it has to be done before your audits, your stage one and your stage two. So um, make sure that you have implemented your program fully. You uh, scheduled your internal audit. You, If you don't have an internal audit function, you pick an internal auditor that's reputable to understand how to audit ISO and have them come in maybe a month before you decide to do your stage one. This will allow you time to take the findings, get them into a repository, and take additional actions on them. So mandatory documents. Let's talk about those real quick. So mandatory documents, as you guys can see, that's a really long list, very long. Um, not all of these things are mandatory. So it's kind of deceiving, but kind of not. The mandatory documents that come from the clauses are mandatory. You have to do those. The items noted as A.7.1.2, A. something, those come from Annex A. Those items are only mandatory as a result of the risk assessment. So, common theme going on here Annex A items are only applicable as a result of the risk assessment for remediation of those unacceptable risks. Um, so, if you end up implementing all of Annex A, then you'll have all of these mandatory documents. Um, and like I said, it's not just going to be governance, risk, and compliance. You need you have to have an inventory of assets. You need to have uh, secure system engineering principles. You need to have incident management. Um, and all of those components stretch across different groups. So definitely not governance, risk, and compliance. Um, our group is just largely, largely going to be responsible for um, ensuring that we hit these things, but not necessarily being the the SMEs of this data. So anatomy of a scope statement. This was also something that I stole from my capstone, but uh, I stole it because I thought it was really good information to give you guys. Now, for your ISO certification, you have to identify the scope of your ISMS. What are you protecting? What are you implementing this for? And so the anatomy of a scope statement is really meant to highlight what exactly you're trying to do, trying to illustrate via your scope statement. So the ISMS, which protects the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, very first part of your anatomy, that CIA triad. Um, you're going to address the business processes, so information and information processing facilities, supporting outpatient services, specializing in mental, et cetera, services, healthcare related. So those are your business processes. That's your second component. Then you're going to state where. Where are you doing these things at? And then what are the applicable controls? And in this case, you can just point to your statement of applicability. So essentially, you have four parts of this anatomy statement or the scope of the anatomy of a scope statement. Um, additionally, you may have an ISMS scope document that's much larger and a little more detailed than just the scope statement. So um, your ISMS scope document may have who your interested parties are. It may discuss the processes a little more detailed. So just keep that in mind as you build this document. 
Um, you definitely have to have your scope statement and it definitely needs to explain what your ISMS is at a high level and what you're trying to achieve with it. Statement of applicability. Highly, highly, highly important document. This document could potentially be client facing if you are allowing um, your certification to leave your control. Maybe you're trying to prove that you have security controls in place. So for your statement of applicability, it is built in a way that it highlights all of the 114 controls from Annex A. And it says, here's the Annex A control, here is the statement of the control, and here's the description. Now you're gonna say whether that control is applicable or not. And then you're gonna provide a justification. And the justification is going to be the result of a risk assessment, or maybe a legal or regulatory requirement driving you to get that um, particular control in place. You're gonna say the control status, so uh, whether it's fully implemented, partially implemented, et cetera, and then any other comments. So while this document, I think it, it has about four controls on here, it's gonna be much longer. It's gonna have more detail. And um, just keep in mind that I do have it shown on here as a spreadsheet. One of the things that I, want to call out maybe as my first lesson learned it doesn't need to be a spreadsheet it doesn't need to be a word document it can be whatever that you want it to be so these processes should highlight the good things that you're already doing and not burden everybody with the new things that you want to do so um if you have a way to track these things in a different way that you want to leverage absolutely do it there's no hard and fast requirement stating that you have to do it in a spreadsheet, you have to do it in a Word document. Um, in fact, I have a client who leveraged monday.com, which is a project management tool, to have their statement of applicability, to have their governance inventory, to have their access control reviews, to have their interested parties, all in this tool that they're already using. So keep that in mind as you build this out. It doesn't need to be overly complex. It can absolutely leverage the things that you have in place to date. So this is one of my favorite sections. It's don't skip where it counts. So we talked about the mandatory things. Um, and some of these things probably could be considered mandatory. However, I would have called these out as don't skip in these places or you will definitely regret it. Um, my first words of wisdom here buy and use the standard. Don't try to use online sources to implement an ISMS. Buy the ISO 27001 standard. Make sure you have it available because when the external auditors come, they are going to want to know that you bought that standard and you implemented everything in accordance with that standard. If you did not buy it, then they're going to question how you went about implementing it. And so you're just going to be in a pickle buy and use that standard it has all the information in it that you need um obviously you'll want to research and do other things but it has all the things that you need to do um to implement your iso program successfully now if you want to take it a step further there is an additional standard that you can buy to support iso 27001 and that is called iso 27002 it is a um bulked up version of ISO 27001, for lack of better words. So you can use the 27002 to better understand the controls in 27001. It is meant to be more informative, to break it down a little bit better for you so you understand what you're doing. Um, definitely buy, buy ISO 27001. ISO 27002 is optional um, if you feel like you need that additional support. My next item here is Communication, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. All this out, it is highly, highly, highly important. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more here in a second. I think it's so important that it deserves its own sub bullet area. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, risk assessments. We call it out as something that you need to do for determining your Annex A items. And that probably should be listed as a mandatory activity. Please, please, please do a risk assessment and do it as well as you can. And what I want you to do is know your environment. Don't let anybody tell you, don't let asset owners, don't let system owners, 
process owners tell you that they don't have risk, that there's no risk associated with their assets, their systems, applications, whatever it is. But I'm here to tell you today, everything has risk. So push back when you need to push back. Don't allow them to tell you that there's no risk because I guarantee you there are risks. Um, it's just a matter of getting it down. Um, and know your environment. Spend the time doing the risk assessment. I promise you it will pay off. You will get to know the environment better. You'll be able to secure it better. And you'll be able to go back to the triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So if you know what risks are in your environment, you can anticipate, you can remediate, you can do all these things, but if you don't know your environment, you're not gonna be able to do that. So make sure you're doing that. And this is another component that is not just GRC. It is highly technical. So keep that in mind, make sure you pull your tech resources to be involved in the conversation. If you um, maybe aren't in a place to do the conversation yourself, pull on your resources. Budget, so for budget, um, I'm not just talking about your, your money or your resources. I'm absolutely talking about your capacity, um, how you'll go about implementation of this program, and then tying into the bullet that I have lower down is knowing how you're going to manage this program on an ongoing basis. So your ISMS implementation is not a once and done. Um, this is something that's highly important to communicate ahead of time. If people believe it's a once and done, then you have a lot of communication ahead of you and you need to budget appropriately. Um, budget also includes considering how much time you're going to need to spend on governance, how many resource hours you're going to spend on that, um, figuring out if you need to outsource internal audit and items like that. So don't skimp here. Make sure you dedicate some time to it. And if you're not the right person, find the right person to help you figure out what your budget should be. Um, Leadership buy-in. This is an important one. We're going to have its own slide for it because this is a foundational item of your ISMS. Um, same with corrective action process. We're going to talk about that one a little more in detail here in a couple slides. So we're just going to skip that one for now. Um, the next one, I'm going to tell you guys a short story. I have been in two audits where I have witnessed someone getting in trouble for this line item. And it is, do not use the ISO logo unless you are authorized. I cannot, like, I, I can't even make this up. I have seen people get in trouble for using that logo during an audit. Do not use the ISO logo. Do not use the ISO logo that you have Googled, you pulled from a website, just don't do it. Don't do it internally. Don't do it externally. Don't use that logo. It is big no-no. Bad juju comes with it. I've seen it two different times. Just don't do it. Um, after you pass your certification, there are approved logos that you can use. Make sure you work with your external auditor to have the right logo. Um, if you use the wrong logo, you are at risk of receiving a major non-conformity during your audit. They may pull it, they will do whatever. I've seen it happen twice where they almost lost it. It was very close call. So please make sure you're using the right logos. Um, know your interested parties. So interested parties, it's kind of a vague word, right? Um, interested parties are your internal. So who's invested in your program? It could be SLT, it could be um, you know, IT, it could be software engineering, it could be whoever. It's just who internally is invested in your program. Now, on the other side of that, you have internal, and now you need external. So external may be outside legal counsel, maybe clients, it may be um, family members associated with your employees, um, maybe patients, things like that. So those are your external. And then to take it a step further, as part of your interested parties, you also want to consider um, legal, regulatory, and contractual obligations. And you want to make sure you're tracking those things because your auditor is going to want to know that you know what is applicable to your environment and that you are tracking those items and you have them implemented. And say, for example, the anatomy of a scope statement. That is a healthcare facility, so they have HIPAA security rule, HIPAA privacy rule applicable to them. And the auditors are going to want to understand that you know that that is something that you have to adhere to as part of 
um, the services you're delivering. So make sure you know your interested parties um, and have them in some sort of repository. Uh, maintain your program after implementation. I have personally experienced where um, an ISMS was implemented that I was not present for. Six months later, I was brought in to provide ongoing maintenance of their program. So meaning I was providing oversight, doing the day-to-day -day activities. And for six months, their program did not operate. And essentially what happened when I got my hands on the program, it resulted in months of rework to reestablish their program. So if you're not planning to um, maintain your program after implementation, this is what I was talking about during return on investment, or is it worth it? You could risk losing a lot of money in that work that you did by having to do rework, by not managing it continuously. So keep that in mind, make sure you're planning for it. Um, understand your ISMS is not just governance risk and compliance. I've hit on this so many times. Please make sure that it, it is not siloed to GRC. This program is so important that all components of your org should be involved. They should know. I'm gonna tell you guys, I spend a lot of time talking with my tech teams that are involved in these projects um, to get to understand their environment, to make sure that we have everything implemented that's applicable and things like that. There is a high tech component here. So understand not just GRC, um, we largely govern it, yes, but we're definitely not the implementers of all the things. So just keep that in mind. And now the last bullet, the item, the last item of don't skip where it counts. So um, those are an achievable time frame. Work with all the people that need to be involved, understand their capacity, um, understand what the tech teams can take on, understand what legal can take on in HR and build a timeline that is actually achievable. If you build an aggressive timeline, you could decrease morale, you can set yourself up for unrealistic expectations, you can do all these things. So make it achievable for your org along with business objectives. I have definitely witnessed times where there are things that needed to happen, but the business did not have the capacity to implement. And you don't want to be in that position. So make sure that you're building this timeline. I can tell you that I have personally led a very aggressive timeline. We did the ISO implementation. By the time we were doing their stage one audit, it was six months. It's very doable. It's very miserable. <laughs> it's not fun. And we know that going into it. So if you choose to do aggressive timeline, everybody should be bought in. Everybody should understand this is aggressive, you need to be on board for it. So keep that in mind. All right, communication. It's its own area. Not everybody's going to be bought in. We all know this. Know your audience. So speak the language of management, speak the language of the implementers, and speak the language of the workforce. Three distinct types of people that you need to talk to that you need to win over. It's not good enough just to have one of these groups bought in. You need to make sure that everybody gets communicated and everybody's bought in um, because these are the foundational pieces of your program. Your program is not going to be optimal unless these people are bought in and they're doing the things that they need to. So speak all the languages. And one thing I like to cap on here, a little nugget that I apply to security awareness, and I got this from a... Um, NIST SAN white paper um, a couple years ago. Their approach to security awareness, which I love, is take it from a marketing aspect. What are you trying to get people to buy or invest in and market to them in that way? So we want these people to be invested. Well, what's in it for them and how can we get them invested in it? And if we can get them invested in it, the communication is going to be better. They're going to absorb the things we want them to do better. So keep that in mind. Think of it as marketing and know your audience. Know how to market to your audience and you will be highly successful. Leadership buy-in. Assemble your best InfoSec team to make sure that you are building a business case and that you are selling to leadership. And this ties into knowing your audience. 
grab those return on investment items I had at the beginning of this presentation, build your business case and make sure leadership's buy-in because I promise you, external auditors gonna wanna talk to them and your program needs to operate with leadership buy-in. So be like the anchor man here, assemble your best InfoSec team, your best anchor man team, and uh, make sure that you're doing all of this to get their buy-in. Now, the last area that we're gonna dig into a little bit deeper as far as don't skip any more accounts, corrective action plans. Please use 10.1, clause 10.1 for nonconformity and corrective action. This clause tells you verbatim what is expected within a corrective action plan. It is very important that you have this process defined and in place before you go through any audit. This is a foundational component of ISMS, as well as a couple of the other things that I mentioned. The repository, it can be a GRC tool, it can be a spreadsheet, it can be whatever you want. Again, going back to that example, I have seen someone use monday.com, not just statement of applicability and governance inventory, they used it for their corrective action plans too. They used it like a ticketing system. So make sure that you have that in place. And don't forget your root cause analysis. If you do not hit the root cause analysis, the non-conformity is never really going to be resolved in the eyes of the auditor. They're going to want to see that you identified the root cause and as part of your corrective actions, you remediated the root cause, therefore stopping any other future occurrences of that same non-conformity. So just make sure you have that addressed as part of your corrective action plans um, I just do a five why root cause analysis for non-conformities. It's simple, just why all the way down the thread until you get to the bottom um, and relatively simple to implement. You just have to make sure that you're hitting all of those components. Okay, so that's a lot, a lot we've discussed so far. We have a couple more areas to go and then we'll wrap this up. Actually, we have one area to go and then we'll wrap this up. So you've done all of this work, you listened to all of Rose's lessons learned, and you took those back and you did all of the hard work. Don't let your hard work be in vain. Make sure that you put a bow on all your hard work. So what I mean by that is create this nice package of things for your auditor, for your program, and take and tie them and make them beautiful. Whatever you want to call it beautiful, just put a bow on it. Make it this nice package, make it something worth presenting. Don't let all of that hard work go to waste. Um, so make sure that you stick in time. So um, what I mean by here is have your audit artifacts for your non-conformities. Know your risk. Have all the components that you needed for your risk assessment. Have all of these things tied together and know how they work together. So tick and tie the things. Build a manual. Um, your ISMS manual is going to be essentially your one-stop shop for all of your things. We're going to, I'm going to show you an example of that in the manual area. Then we have continuous improvement. Um, don't let your hard work be in vain by not ensuring that your continuous improvement is happening. Um, if you implement your ISO 27001 program appropriately or in accordance with clauses 4 through 10, you have no choice but to continuous improve. So make sure that you do that and that you are constantly seeking that next maturity level. Um, and then audit prep. So I got you this far, got you the lessons learned, got you all these things that make sure you don't forget. And there's tons more that I didn't include here. Audit prep is super important. Don't forget this part. So manual. This is your repository of all of your things you did through the year um, that pull together your ISMS. Um, and you use your manual to take entire your evidence. Now, a huge disclaimer here, it does not need to be folders like this. I'm just showing you a structure. It can be in any repository that you want. So common theme here is leverage what you have available to you while not creating unnecessary processes. So leverage whatever repository that you want. Just have this stuff together. It's going to make your life so much easier when you're trying to go through audits and things like that. All right, audit prep. I 
went through a, my very first audit. I was so nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And I got out the other side of it, and it was like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulder. And I thought to myself, man, what would have made my life easier? You know what would have made my life easier? All of these prep things that I'm about to give you guys that I wish I would have known. So um, first things first, select your auditor. Make sure that you are selecting a reputable auditor. You do some research on it because this is going to be the team that's auditing you. So make sure you do your due diligence here and figure out who you want to be doing it. Uh, know the technology that's going to be used for the audit. With the pandemic, a lot of things have been virtual or, you know, hybrid. So just make sure that you understand the technology, that you have the teams worked out in advance. It seems like such a small thing, but the technology really can stress people out the day of the audit. And we want to reduce stress to our counterparts the best that we can when we're going into this audit. Um, so just make sure you understand that. Create a checklist. So um, this is probably the thing that I use the most as part of getting ready for an audit. Um, I understand all the different things that we have to do. What are the mandatory things? What are we, you know, what are the not mandatory things, but they're used to support other items? Have your list together because what you're going to do with that list is you're going to get all of your things together. You're going to assign it to people and do all of those activities. But then you're going to have a prep session with your main stakeholders. And what I mean by main stakeholders is people that own processes that are, um, critical to your ISMS. So um, maybe your CISO or maybe your GRC lead or the person that runs vulnerability management, any of those types of people um, that you consider the main stakeholder. And what you're going to do, you're going to sit down and go through that checklist that you just spent months getting together, taking in time and doing all that work. And as a group, you're going to review all the evidence and get everybody on the same page. Because what you don't want to happen is you go into your audit, everybody's on different pages. You don't know what's going on. So um, make sure you have that prep session. I generally do it for eight hours. Um, I promise you people are not miserable. Like you bit time up, we build in breaks. Um, but everybody gets on the same page and we do it about three weeks ahead of the audit. And it allows us time to go back and like, hey, that's a, that's a gap. You have a misspelling, you have this, and it's like a mini QA session. So um, keep that in mind. Now, taking it a step further, prep the auditees. So anybody that is on hook to get interviewed, please make sure that you sit down with these people, you tell them what to expect, what to not say, what to say, how much is too much wordings, and things like that, and give them the confidence that they need to go into these audits. I promise you, you will be very happy that you did that because not only are you going to reduce their stress and their anxiety, they're going to be more willing to do it in the future and your audit's generally going to go better. So make sure that you talk with them and you get them ready for their audit. Um, and then last piece of advice I have here is set up a private chat during your audit and um, leverage it to have offline communications regarding things that need to be um, displayed to the auditor, or um, things that you need to tell the auditor or things that you don't want to tell the auditor. And this allows you to have private dialogue going on during your audit um, and that not everything's happening in a black hole. So um, just some tips there and that's um, audit prep. So that's it. That is my crash course and all the things that I learned. I definitely think I'm missing some things here. Um, because it's a very large program to implement. There's a lot of ins and outs to it. Um, so I have my wrap up here um, because there's just so much to cover and I didn't have it all in here. If you have any questions about what I covered today or things that you want to pick my brain on or you just want to get advice, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me on Twitter. Um, email or LinkedIn, or if you are interested in hearing what CISO could do for you as a company, um, please feel free to reach out. We can work um, remotely. We can work with all sorts of clients. So feel free to reach out if you need assistance in that area or just reach out if you'd like to chat. Um, I did include a bunch of references in this presentation. Um, the very first reference is actually the ISO 2001 handbook that I used to teach my capstone a few weeks ago. 
the rest of them are just a lot of different online sources that I've used in the past couple years that I thought were very um, interesting that I thought you guys would benefit from. So um, that is it. That is my presentation. I want to thank all of you guys for coming today. And I truly hope that you guys learned something and that um, you'll be able to take these things back and apply it in your environment. Um, so with that, um, have a great day. In pursuit of their mission, the CompTIA student chapter at UTSA aims to transition all members from college students to qualified entry-level cybersecurity professionals through providing a cyber smart community, hosting professional guest speaker events, facilitating collegiate cybersecurity competitions, company spotlight events, and providing support for acquiring professional cybersecurity certifications prior to graduating. The chapter serves as a growing community resource for over 300 active student members, alumni, and professionals, and has just been awarded the 2021 Most Outstanding New Student Organization at UTSA by the University Life Awards. We continue to extend all of our support to new talents breaking into cybersecurity. Have we interested you? The chapter is always looking for ways you can gain support to be able to expand this amazing community. If you would like to help, we are always open to discussing possibilities for future events, and we are looking for enthusiastic speakers and companies who would like to connect UTSA cyber students. We're also open to collaborating with others to put on competitions, such as Capture the Flag or other engaging events to help bring our chapter members resourceful opportunities to develop. If any of this grabbed your attention, feel free to reach out to one of our members in this event's official Discord server under our channel, the CompTIA student chapter at UTSA, for any questions you may have. We're looking forward to hearing from you and possibly working with you. Thank you for listening and hope you enjoy the event.